26, but I, it is in fa Facebook Live as well. So um, we are delighted to discuss about NK vasculitis as well as its uh, nephrology impact and nephritis. So um, we have uh, our speaker um, that is uh, Syed Wakar Mohansan, as well as myself, and we have a very distinguished panelist. So Wakar Mohansan graduated from Dhaka Medical College. Thereafter, he worked for uh, Bangladesh Health Services, and then he came to America, and he has done his um, MPH uh, in epidemiology. Thereafter, he worked uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, for the uh, county health department. And then he did his residency and fellowship at Indianapolis, India, Indiana. And uh, he was actually um, a, a very good resident, and he was a part of his prestigious Jeopardy team. So currently he's uh, practicing as a rheumatologist at uh, Rush Memorial Hospital. I must say there are very few Bangladeshi born rheumatologists practicing in America at this time. We are very lucky to have Walker Mazen. He's my friend and brother. And uh, his, uh, he, his hobbies include uh, travel, and uh, he used to collect stamp in the past, and he likes research, so uh, any kind of research. Now I'll present uh, our respected panelist, uh, Professor Ayubali Choudhury. Uh, he's a professor and a former director of National Institute of Kidney no. Disease. <laughs> and uh, Ayubali Choudhury, uh, he's also the chief consultant for uh, Shonara Bangla Foundation. Uh, then uh, Babru Lalom, he's uh, currently the professor and the director of National Institute of Kidney Disease and Neurology in Dhaka. Uh, he's also the uh, Secretary General of Bangladesh Renal Association. Uh, then uh, Dr. Kazi uh, Alam Shahnur, uh, he's uh, also the professor and uh, the head of nephrology department at National Institute of Kidney Disease and Neurology. He is also the vice president of Bangladesh Renal Association. Yes. Then uh, Professor Nurul Huda, he is a professor and head of the department at uh, Chittagong College. Uh, and he is also the vice president of Bangladesh Renal Association. Uh, finally, last but not the least, uh, Professor Mogashar Alam. He is professor and the head of nephrology, Rangpur Medical College, as well as the vice president of Bangladesh Renal Association. So with, uh, without further ado, I'd like to request uh, Dr. Mozem to start his presentation. Dr. Mozem, please share your slide. And um, All right, can you see them? Yes, yes. we can. <laughs> yes. All right, okay, good mo uh, morning to those who are in the USA and good evening uh, for those doctors uh, who are in Bangladesh. So hopefully we'll have a very uh, informative session today and we each will learn something at the end of our discussion. Um, I am going to talk about uh, ANCA associated vasculitis and so we'll have some updates. In general, uh, vasculitis itself is a very broad topic as you know. Um, it has, uh, it could, could be because of the primary process or it could be because of some underlying disease condition. ANCA is actually a primary process. And just for, uh, you know, a brief introduction, a vasculitis are uh, in one sentence, basically inflammatory infiltrates, which is predominantly leukocyte in the uh, mural structure and causing destruction of the mural structure with inflammatory process, ultimately uh, causing uh, blood supply compromise, uh, compromisation to the downstream tissue uh, leading to tissue ischemia and necrosis. That's pretty, uh, in a nutshell what vasculitis is. Uh, ANCA itself is a very, not a very common disease, uh, 20 per million incidence rate, but when it happens, it can be a very devastating disease. So 
uh, and also like anchor itself is also a very broad topic. I'm just going to focus on three key points. One is the diagnostic test, the ANCA antibody itself. If you understand that well, then you will have a, a strong grip on the disease itself. And then uh, I'll talk about few updates in the management that we have achieved in the last 20 years. Finally, I will also address a key issue and is a very common question is how the duration of how long we should continue the maintenance therapy. So ANCA, uh, sorry, uh, the vasculitis is classified based on the size of the blood vessels and ANCA belongs to the small vessel size. You can see there is another group also that belongs to a small vessel group is immune complex deposition. And the key difference between ANCA and immune complex vasculitis is in, circulate, in immune complex uh, vasculitis, you have deposition of circulating immune body, uh, immune complex, and also activation of complement cascade. But ANCA, uh, in ANCA associated vasculitis, you don't see circulating immune complex deposition and activation of immune complex. These two things is very important to keep in mind. And um, you can see in the middle, we have anti-GBM disease, which is actually the disease of predominantly of the nephrology. Um, um, uh, I mean, it's a concern for the nephrologist most of the time. And it's because in anti-GBM, we see 10 to 50% cases, a positive ANCA test. When you see that, that indicates a high risk of relapse. And we'll talk about it down there, so. Um, ANCA itself is a very broad disease and I don't want to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to actually discuss in details of the different ANCA, but it has a well-established relationship with GPA, which used to be the Wagner's and then MPA and EGPA, which is called, which used to be called charles strauss disease. Then you also have a distinct entity, which is renal limited vasculitis and Dr. Islam probably will discuss that as well. So for ANCA-associated vasculitis, the detection of ANCA is uh, the key. And that's why we need to know a little bit about what's, what that antibody actually looks like, how you diagnose that. So to understand ANCA, the name itself will tell you what it is, is the N stands for neutrophil. So it's predominantly neutrophil and monocyte, and the C stands for cytoplasm. That will differentiate this from the ANA. ANA is the uh, antibody directed against the chromatin materials or antibody inside the nucleus. And in ANCA, it's the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm of the mononuclear, uh, sorry, the monocyte or uh, neutrophil, you have these granules. These granules have uh, multiple peptides, those are involved in oxidative and non-oxidative bacterial killing. Now, among these peptides, the two of are important to us. One is the MPO and the other one is PR3. Now, PR3 is positively, uh, I'm sorry, negatively charged. So it will be always in the cytoplasm because the nuclear membranes are negatively charged. And MPO, is positively charged, so it will be predom it will be predominantly, not always, in the periphery of the uh, nucleus. Okay. Why this not okay? Now to understand, we briefly will discuss about. I'm sorry, I think I skipped one. Let me see. Yes, so um, ANCA testing involved two step process. One is the IFA and then the ELISA. Both tests are important. So when you suspect someone with uh, ANCA associated vasculitis, you need to order both of them and you will um, understand why. So first one will give us the, the pattern of the distribution of the antibody. As I have told you before, the PR3 is in the cytoplasm because it is negatively charged. So it will be always in the cytoplasmic area. 
and the P anchor pattern, which involve MPO and other peptides, which are uh, positively charged, will be along the perimeter of the nucleus. And in terms of sensitivity and specificity, ANCA is highly sensitive, but not very specific. But ELISA, I'm sorry, not ANCA, the IFA. IFA is highly sensitive, uh, but not very specific test. But ELISA itself is a very specific test because it specifically tells you whether you have a PR3 or MPO. So just to understand uh, what IFA is, is uh, just to recapitulate our memory, uh, you have a fixed antigen on a slide and you put patient's antibody that is linked to fluorescent dye. If the antibody binds to antigen on the slide, then you will have the fluorescent under the uh, ultraviolet light. That's the basic principle. For ELISA, it's a little complicated, I mean, little uh, complicated than uh, IFA. You have uh, indirect ELISA, which is mostly used for detection of MPO and PR3. You have four steps. You have captured antibody on a slide. Then you add the patient's sera, which has the antigen. Then you ca capture the ant circulating antigen, and then you wash them. And then you add antibody that are linked to enzyme. And then we add substrate that leads to different color changes. Those color changes are plotted against the standardized curve, and that will give us uh, the uh, positive and negative test. This is just in summary. So what does it look like in IFA? If, uh, and now it will probably be very uh, easy to understand for you. The left-hand side is the cytoplasmic uh, pattern where you have predominantly PR3, and the right side is the perinuclear pattern. That's why it's called p -anca. So that it is very uh, important to remember the p -anca, and you will understand down the road why p -anca, uh, oh, uh, they, so p -anca can be positive in some other, other diseases as well, because the p -anca is not only MPO, you, it, you have some other peptides in, in the granule that can also, that is also uh, positively charged. And that is why it's always in the, peri most of the time in the perimeter of the nucleus. So ANCA is very uh, sensitive and specific. And also it has distinct relationship with some of the subcategories of the ANCA associated vasculitis, like PR3 is always with uh, GPA or Wagner and MPO ANCA can be MPA and with the EGPA. Uh, EGPA is not always ANCA positive, but when it is positive, it's always associated with MPO. Uh, and activity. The other thing is, can we have a dual positivity? Yes, we can, but it's very rare and it's mostly seen in levomizole induced and associated vasculitis. Now in the US, the levomizole is used as a additive uh, for cracked cocaine. Uh, those are sold in the, in, mostly in the inner cities. And most of the time, the patient population that we see in um, the mesol induced vasculitis in the, is in the inner city. In fact, when I was a fellow, I, I encountered a couple of them, and they usually present with a, a pretty severe skin manifestation. Um, I haven't seen any when I, um, since completing my residency, because I don't practice in the inner city anymore. So it's pretty dominantly where you have this uh, high incidence of cocaine use. Now in EGPA, as you see that when it is positive with MPO, then you need to think about high risk of renal involvement. Although the predominant cause of death is cardiovascular, but with PR3, the renal uh, um, involvement is pretty high. And about the uh, dual positivity with anti-GBM and ANCA, I have probably uh, covered this, but it is, mostly seen with anti-GBM disease. So when you have an ANCA positivity, it is predominantly with ANCA, uh, with the anti-GBM disease, not the other way around, which is when we have an ANCA vasculitis, we rarely see anti-GBM positivity. So that's also important to know. So um, to diagnose a case of ANCA-associated vasculitis in the appropriate clinical setting, you have to have to you have to order two tests that is IFA and ELISA both. You cannot just 
uh, uh, order only one. And it, you have to have two positivity, like you have to have a C or P and K positivity and with appropriately positivity of anti-PR3 or anti-MPO in ELISA. If one of them is positive, means if IFA positive and ELISA is negative, then the diagnostic the diagnosis is not very, uh, it's not, a, it doesn't have a very diagnos a reliable diagnostic um, yield. Now, uh, some pitfall, can we have a negative ANCA? Yes, we can, Very uh, not very common. Uh, in, in those cases, you can have a, uh, PR3 MPO positivity, and usually it's seen in the GPA and MPA world. Uh, the reason actually uh, it is not, now we have found that it is not actually the uh, negative in true sense. It's our um, current method of identifying the ANCA is not uh, sensitive enough because of the high ceruloplasmin level in those cases. Uh, and those high ceruloplasmin level we see mostly in the active disease stage. And that is why you can see a negative ANCA. Now, can, uh, and, 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 and I have the uh, EGPA, uh, 40 to 60% time will have a negative ANCA. And if that's the case, then most of the time it's the less severe disease like non-renal and non-pulmonary involvement. And lastly, PNCA. Um, as you remember, I told you that PNCA can be uh, not only MPO, but other peptides. And those, that's why uh, if there is a PNCA and negative MPO, then, and if you still have some clinical symptoms going on, then you should, uh, it can be seen in inflammatory bowel disease, excuse me, lupus. And we are, I also see them in um, one of the, um, I think it's in the liver disease that you can see that, which is related to ulcerative colitis. Our uh, pitfall continues. Um, can we have a false positive anchor? Yes. And that is why it is important when you have clinical suspicion, please do rule out infection when you have a PR3 anchor because it is can it can be positive with bacterial infection. Do rule out the uh, associated uh, like it's drug induced uh, and associated vasculitis such as uh, drug induced hydrolazine uh, vasculitis uh, propyl thioracil and sometimes we also see them in minocycline as well and it's most of all the time mpo and cannot be a three anca i already discussed min, uh, liver measles um, in anca negative vasculitis of course you have to do a biopsy um, to confirm the diagnosis So in summary, ANCA is a very important test and the most important test in the diagnosis of ANCA-associated vasculitis. It is an excellent diagnostic tool uh, in the appropriate clinical setting. It also gives you some uh, prediction and outcome about the disease itself. If you have a PR3 positivity, then there is a high risk of relapse. If you have PR uh, MPO positivity, such as in EGPA, there is high likely involvement of organs such as renal involvement. And sometimes if you have one relapse, then there is high risk of subsequent relapse. There are new markers that are under investigation, but not available yet. And there are some genetic markers are also under investigation, which are not in clinical practice yet. Oh, uh, the underlying one that I have mentioned, and uh, that's a very common question. Um, do we use or can we use ANCA as a prognostic marker? And that's very important because it, um, it's little debatable. In a rheumatologic world, we don't use it as a prognostic marker, but I know a lot of nephrology uh, in the world of nephrology that that's, uh, some physician do use it. Um, you have some, you know, you, um, there are rationale behind it, but uh, in our practice, we just use one time for diagnosis and after that we don't keep in, uh, you know keep tracking it i will just briefly discuss about clinical feature like any rheumatologic condition anca can affect multiple organ system uh, among them upper respiratory is very common uh, any uh, stubborn sinusitis you should keep anca vasculitis in your mind any pulmonary hemorrhage or multiple pulmonary nodule that are non-malignant uh, should uh, keep ANCA in your mind. 
uh, nephritis, of course. Uh, if you have a case of wrist drop, foot drop, which is the neuropathy, uh, um, should raise your uh, red flag uh, for anchor associated vasculitis or any kind of vasculitis. It's a, it's a pretty common clinical picture in vasculitic uh, world. And then if you have pseudo tumor, that also is, uh, should raise a flag for uh, digging a little deeper for anchor associated vasculitis. Scleritis you can, but it's, uh, it is also associated with rheumatoid and other uh, rheumatologic condition, but pseudo tumor is important. Uh, any purpuric rash should raise suspicion for vasculitis and should be biopsied, should, uh, you should biopsy that. And then of course, ANCA should be is in there in your differential. Um, let's move on. I'm just going to briefly talk about renal limited vasculitis. Uh, just to understand in any ANCA associated vasculitis, risk of renal involvement is always there. So it can affect the renal uh, uh, in association with other organ involvement. But this one is a separate entity. This is only uh, um, the renal involvement. You will not have any other organ um, involvement most of the time. And it is always ANCA positive with 96% uh, you know, um, positivity and MPO, um, it's always MPO ANCA. The other two key point is this specific type or, or any uh, uh, renal involvement in ANCA associated vasculitis is, is POSI immune, means no immune complex deposition. That's why it's called POSI immune. And again, since ANCA does not activate complement cascade, so you will not see any low ANCA level in uh, any ANCA associated vasculitis and also renal limited vasculitis. Let's move on to uh, treatment. Uh, in the last 20 years, we had some good quality, um, very su uh, highly successful, uh, large multi-center randomized trial that has given us a pretty good grip on the, in the management of ANC associated vasculitis. And, uh, but still, glucocorticoid still has its place as a first place. We always start patient with glucocorticoid. The management of uh, ANCA vasculitis uh, are divided into two phase, remission induction phase and maintenance phase. And glucocorticoid has its place in both phases. In remission induction, always high dose, one milligram per kilogram. We always use 60, some physician use 80, but in the, uh, most of the rheumatologists use 60. And then the, in the maintenance phase, we try to win the prednisone below 10 milligram per day. Uh, with the use of disease modification drug and biologics such as rituximab. Uh, the standard of care also, uh, uh, you know, based on two entities. One is the non-severe case and severe case. How do you determine this is a severe ANCA? Any ANCA that has no organ involvement or not life-threatening is non-severe ANCA. And in any ANCA that has some organ involvement, uh, major organ involvement and or life threatening is severe and asthma, severe and CAR. So the uh, non severe cases, uh, always oral glucocorticoid, 60 milligram. And if, if for some it's 80, but 60 is the standard. Uh, and then you start tapering after a few weeks. You can also start with methotrexate if the symptoms are that not, uh, symptoms are mild. And you can continue that in the remission maintenance phase. We always use rituximab. It is available, insurance pay for it. So most of the time we use rituximab. And the dose is one gram, two weeks apart. And after that, we can wait. And we'll discuss about the maintenance uh, uh, phase uh, treatment down the road. So again, the severe uh, ANCA is organ involvement or life-threatening. That's severe. And what are the life-threatening condition? Active uh, glomerular nephritis, pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, cerebellar vasculitis, uh, if you have uh, orbital pseudomot uh, pseudotumor, and scleritis, and GI bleed. Those are, and sometimes cardiac involvement as well. Those are life-threatening life condition. So in the, um, uh, when we have a life-threatening condition of severe ANCA, 
the treatment is in the remission induction phase always uh, pulse steroid, one gram solomedrol, three days, followed by oral glucocorticoid six, uh, high dose, 60 milligram, and gradual uh, taper. And in, uh, at the same time, we use rituximab. The REF trial has pretty much sealed the deal. Uh, it has, uh, the rituximab is non-inferior to cyclophosphamide. Uh, it has less side effect profile, be very well tolerated. Uh, we don't need uh, much uh, monitoring and it is paid for, for by the insurance. So most of the time uh, it is the rituximab in the uh, United States. After the first uh, uh, remission induction phase of rituximab, then you can decide to switch to azathioprine, uh, a methotrexate as a first line, and you know, mycophenolate is always the second and third, third choice. The dose for azathioprine is two milligram per kilogram, uh, with starting with 50, and then you can gradually uptitrate the dose. For methotrexate, it's always 15 milligram, then you gradually uptitrate all the way up to 25 milligram. Mycophenolate is 15 to 3000. Uh, for uh, dose for remission maintenance, we will talk about uh, in our upcoming slides. Now, what about plasma exchange and reduced glucocorticoid dose? Uh, well, plasma exchange has been used, and um, but does it work? So we have this large trial. We call it uh, PEXIVAS, and it has a 700 participant. It's a randomized uh, placebo control trial. Um, you everybody got cyclophosphamide and rituximab after pulse steroid, and then they were randomized to plasma exchange and no plasma exchange. And each group was again randomized to reduced glucose and standard glucose. The standard glucose is 60, then gradual taper 10 milligram each time you taper. The reduced dose is just half of the standard dose. Reduced dose doesn't mean the low dose. It's just the half of the standard dose. The primary endpoint for this study was industrial renal disease and death. So this is a uh, one slide uh, pretty much tells everything about the study itself. Uh, unfortunately, the, it, the study did not meet the primary uh, outcome. That is the uh, plasma exchange uh, in uh, reducing the death or endless renal disease. So what would be the place of plasma exchange in 2023 for the management of anti associated vasculitis? Well, since this study, say, Pexivas did not show benefit and there were some other meta-analysis that showed few uh, or mixed results. So that's why the American College of Rheumatology do not recommend using it in, uh, in the anti associated vasculitis management. But it does have its place in nephrology world. Uh, you, uh, I think a lot of uh, nephrologists use it in anti-GBM when they have an anchor positivity. And I think Dr. Islam is going to cover that um, uh, in his um, talk. Now, this uh, trial have given us at least uh, one um, very good uh, result, which is the reduced dose, use of reduced dose of glucocorticoid in the management of anchor associated vasculitis. So let's go back to the, uh, the slide. If you look at this on the uh, right hand side, the standard dose glucocorticoid and reduced dose glucocorticoid, the primary outcome was non-inferiority and it did achieve its goal. This is the uh, KM curve and it's showing the uh, risk of death or endless renal disease. Uh, and that is uh, the reduced dose was non-inferior to standard dose. The other good outcome of this study was that obviously it is uh, pretty um, well understood. You have reduced dose and so you have less serious adverse or serious infection uh, in one year period. So what again to understand what the reduced dose mean, if you look at the study, uh, the, the first two week for the standard dose was 60 milligram followed by 10 milligram taper. And then we have the reduced dose, first week of 60 milligram. Then from second week onwards, the dose was half. So 30, if it was 50, then it's 25, 40, then it's 20, and then on. It is not, again, the reduced dose doesn't mean low steroid. It's just the reduced dose compared to standard dose. So uh, in summary, is yes. 
the a reduced dose of glucocorticoid was non inferior to standard dose and also resulted in fewer uh, serious infection and that's why uh, the reduced dose uh, is now in use we you, uh, always use uh, we don't use a reduced dose in uh, in the remission, uh, you know in the induction phase we still use the high dose but when we start taper we start using the half of the standard dose What about no steroid? Well, yes, we do have a drug and that will let, let us in the future, hopefully when the cost go down, we use it for using no steroid at all, mostly in the maintenance phase. So this is this drug, Avacapone, was approved in 2021 after this uh, result was published in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so we need to know how this uh, Avacapone work. Avacapone, is a strong inhibitor of or selective inhibitor of C5A. Now, I have told you the ANCA does not involve the complement pathway, but the neutrophil is the main drive force for ANCA associated vasculitis. So, if we can prevent the chemotaxis of neutrophil in the inflammatory process, then we reduce the inflammation. And that's pretty much the concept. So uh, once, uh, and uh, C5A is a strong chemotactic factor. So if we can stop the C5A, then we stop the chemotax, uh, chemotaxis uh, uh, migration of neutrophil in the inflammatory site, and thereby we prevent the destruction of the tissue, which is the hallmark of anca associated vasculitis. So this um, advocate her, um, um, pivotal phase, it was a phase three trial, there are two groups. They were all the randomized to Avacapon group and prednisone group. Both group got cyclophosphamide as their initial uh, induction phase or rutoximab. And after that, they had Avacapon uh, with matching placebo prednisone. And the prednisone group got Avacapon as uh, Avacapon matching placebo, uh, same frequency and the prednisone with gradual taper. The primary outcome was non-inferiority and the study did meet its goal. The, the st statistically significant, it did show that avacapone was non-inferior to prednisone. This is the KM curve. It's showing uh, the probability of relapse. As you can see, it remained pretty much flat and the prednisone there was a higher risk of relapse. The important to know about the hazard ratio, which is 46%, which is pretty good. 46, so that means the, the uh, Avacapon group had 46% less likely to have relapse compared to prednisone group. That's the key point of hazard ratio. Sorry. Now, I'm sorry. So what is the place of Avacapone in the uh, management algorithm of ANCA associated vasculitis? See, this is a very expensive drug, so, and not very widely used, but what we see now that it probably has a, will have a very, very um, significant role in the remission maintenance phase. And um, usually the current trend is if you cannot reduce the dose of your a patient's prednisone less than 20 milligram a day, despite using the disease modifying drug or rituximab, then it, it, it does help a lot. So if you can get it approved, I mean, in the, in the US, if we can get it approved, then it really helps the patient, but it is still a very expensive drug. Now let's um, move on to the uh, last uh, key point, which is the, how long should we continue the maintenance therapy. Now, this is actually a very debatable topic. It varies from patient's factor, uh, physician's comf comfort zone. Um, in general, after in, uh, the initial induction phase, all patients should get maintenance therapy for 12 to 24 months. Now, when do you start this uh, maintenance phase? For rutoximab, six months after the first one, and for cyclophosphamide, uh, two to four weeks uh, of the last dose, and your white cell count has to be more than 3,500. 
Now there was two big trial. One was on azathioprine uh, compared to the duration, two year versus, versus four year. And then we had the other um, uh, trial that um, examined the dosing of rutoximab for the maintenance therapy. So this large trial, over 115 patients in the French vasculitic study, they evaluated the efficacy of extended, that is the continuation of rutoximab as maintenance regimen. All these patients got cyclophosphamide and glucocorticoid, and they were all severe cases, mostly GPA. The, after the initial uh, cyclophosphamide, uh, they were all randomized to rutoximab and azathioprine. The azathioprine got, uh, patient group got 22 months of azathioprine with tapering at the end. And the rutoximab group, after the initial induction, zero, that is zero week and 40, uh, so, sorry, it should be two, 14 days. So uh, zero week and uh, two weeks, then six weeks, 12 weeks, and 18 months. The primary endpoint was the 28 month, uh, major relapse after 28 months of follow up. And after 28 months, the rutoximab group did show less relapse compared to the placebo, which is the azathioprine group in this case. This is again the KM curve showing the probability of uh, relapse of major and minor, uh, um, ma sorry, major and minor relapse in uh, um, NK-associated vasculitis in the maintenance phase. And if you can see in the top, on the top, there is this rutoximab, zero, then two weeks, then um, six month, 18 month, and the azathioprine at the end, like after I think 12 months, they started tapering it. Now look at the gap. So I didn't put it here, but the hazard ratio was 6.6. .6. And that indicates the 6.6 .6 means that the, the azathioprine group had 6.6 .6 times more likelihood to have relapse compared to the toximab group. That's what the uh, KM curve show. So um, clearly, rutoximab does have a good um, um, effect on maintaining the patient, uh, reducing the, uh, controlling the patient's uh, uh, in, uh, symptoms. So what would be the um, option for maintenance of uh, therapy in the ANC associated vasculitis in 2023? Well, everybody should get maintenance therapy for 12 to 24 months. And after that, if you see patient has multiple risk factor like organ involvement, severe organ involvement, or they have a high PR3 um, giving you the sense that the patient might have relapse, you can continue for 36 months or you can continue that indefinitely. If patient has one relapse, then this is always indefinite treatment. You can, the milder cases, you can watch and reevaluate after fast dose of rituximab or you can continue as it happening for 18 months and then gradually start tapering. You can also, in the milder cases, you can also use azathioprine and methotrexate in appropriate cases. When we use rituximab, the frequency is every six months. And the dose, the FDA approved dose is 500, but in, in real world, it's always one gram. We give it just one time. We don't do that two weeks apart, just one time. That's for maintenance treatment. Of course, cost is a concern, very expensive drug, but most of the time it is covered by insurance. And the other one is the risk of infection. I, you know, I have a lot of patients on rutoximab for rheumatoid arthritis for many, many years. Um, and I have few vasculitic patients, those who are getting rutoximab every six months. I haven't had any, I haven't encountered any serious infection in any of these patients. I do monitor their um, immunoglobulin level, IgG, IgM, IgA, um, after like two or three infusion, because if you have a very low uh, uh, immunoglobulin level in patients who are receiving uh, rituximab, then you can adjust the dose or you can skip the dose and you need to be a little bit careful. So that's what we do to monitor for risk. And lastly, this is the um, um, 2021 American College of Rheumatology uh, um, you know, uh, vas vasculitis algorithm. 
if, if you want to review it, you can review it. But this is pretty much what I have told you uh, in the previous slides. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mozen. Uh, we're going to have our respected panelists comment on your on your uh, program that you did right after my presentation. So can you please take yourself off of the um, slide share? Yeah. All right. Mm. Did I not do it? Yeah, you did. OK. Thank you, Akar Bhai. Assalamu alaikum. Well, can you see my slide now? Yes. Can you see? Yeah. Yeah, I can see. Sorry, I was muted. Before I start that um, one announcement, we are happy to have. Uh, Professor Babul Alam, he's also, uh, we're very proud to say that he's the director of National Institute of Kidney Disease and Neurology. He's among us. Uh, so welcome, Abrul. And you, uh, yeah, so so uh, Walker nicely paved the way for me. So we're going to now discuss about ANCA and its effect on the kidney. This is very interesting that ANCA is a diagnostic test and we are using it as a disease diagnosis, which is very unique because we don't use creatinine as renal failure. So I thought that is interesting. Okay, so um, basically ANCA GN is relevant in RPGN, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. It is rapid, it is progressive, it causes renal failure. So, by definition, rapid loss of renal function, which is 50% rise in creatinine. Notice that is percentage rise in creatinine, not a specific point of rising creatinine, which is distinctly different than AKI's diagnosis and uh, definition. And the urine is nephritic. Uh, so we have like a, because of intense inflammation, uh, the basement membrane is torn, red cells are going there, there will be RBC cast. And histopathologically, we'll explain this to patient have cellular crescent, and it has a diagnostic and prognostic value as well. Walker Mazum has already told us about the clinical features because this is a rare disease. We should uh, train our students so that they can uh, have high suspicion because the specialists, we are the specialists. So if we miss it, other people are not going to be able to diagnose it. But since it's a systemic disease, we need to look into systemic features like fever, uh, anemia, joint pain, skin rash, uh, maybe um, uh, cranial nerve pulses, chronic sinusitis. Uh, I encourage all my students to look at the urine under microscope. Even if you don't have face contrast microscope, you need to see the crenated RBCs. Under face contrast, it looks like Mickey Mouse, uh, like this Mickey Mouse. But, you know, if you have a habit of doing it, you'll see. Even if you don't see the cast, you can see crenated RBCs. They see this is a crenated RBC. Okay, so among those RPGN, the rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, ANCA is the, has the highest representation, which is posse immune disorder. So about 65 to 70% of the crescentic GN is actually posse immune and then anti-GBM is 15% and immune complex. Immune complex, uh, like uh, it can be lupus, it can be IgA nephropathy, uh, it can be uh, MPGN, but their presentation is 25 to 30%. This is a very, very rare disease. I have only few patients in my practice. Uh, interestingly, last 10 days, two of my ANCA patients uh, with the GN, they came to see me. I don't know how that happened but it's 0 0.5 to 24 cases per million per year. So can you believe this? Then in the United States at this time, we have less than 200,000 and uh, RPGN patients in the United States. So that means out of like 
330 million people, we have only like less than 200,000, which makes it a very uh, rare disease. By definition, any disease prevalence that has less than 200,000 in America, it is a rare disease, then they are allowed to go for an orphan drug. Orphan drugs, the other advantage is they can charge high amount like one of these drugs, Eclizumab, which costs $500,000 a year. Let's go to identify RPGN. So I think I have a little bit of a problem with the definition of RPGN. We don't have days to weeks to save the kidney or the patient. We should be more aggressive than that. But I will share you creatinine kinetics. We know that there is limitation of creatinine in terms of diagnosis, how it is dependent on the muscle mass, how it does not correlate with the level of the renal failure. Here you can see it was published in um, uh, Nephro American Journal of uh, Nephrology in 2009. It shows 24 hour after 90% reduction in creatinine clearance. With a, when the patient had normal serum creatinine, the curtain went up by 2.5 times or 246%. Whereas in CKD4, it only went up by 0.5. So therefore, if the patients have more advanced disease, we are less likely to identify a severity of the disease that like, a, like something like RPGN. So therefore, I think this does not quite define, a, uh, it's not a very way of identifying that, but this is how it is defined. So uh, I'm gonna go into a little bit of uh, immunopathology uh, for the students uh, mainly. So we have all these vasculitis that we have, especially the RPGNs. There are many of these are immune complex disorders. So actually in nephrology and glomerular pathology thing, other than hypertension and diabetes, majority of the other things are immune disorders. If you see that it is an immune complex that is formed with like lupus, the complexes are uh, floating in the blood and then they get into the um, glomeruli and here, uh, they cause an inflammation and they will bind complements as well. We have planted antigen. What is a planted antigen? I think I, we know that IgA nephropathy is because of a galactose deficient IgG4. So this becomes planted when it is filtering through the kidney and that we call the planted antigen because they're planted in the mesangium. Then the antibody forming against that causes the inflammation and it binds complement. So these are examples of planted antigen. Then we have inside antigen, we have anti-GBM disease. Also antiphospholipase A2 receptor antibody that forms against an antigen of the protocytes. So these are basic concepts that we need to understand that uh, the most of the disease are actually immune disease. There is a little more elaboration, but I'm not going into details of this. So an immune complex in situ, and then circulating immune complex deposition, and ANCA. ANCA, we call it post-immune, uh, because interestingly, all the effect of the ANCA is inside the blood vessels, because as Dr. Mazin says, everything starts with the neutrophil level. But then afterwards, neutrophil will break into the basement membrane, and that's when it starts inflammation. So initially, it is actually in the bloodstream, which is unique for a, a, a post-immune disorder. Here, uh, I like this photo, the RPG, and we can see that um, there is crescent and capillary loop on the top. Here, we can see granular immune complex deposit, which can happen is post-infectious GN or um, IgA nephropathy. The bottom one is very linear, ribbon-like. This is uh, the anti-GVM antibody, obviously. And posse immune, because nothing much lighted up. So there is posse means very little. It's not no. So there's a little bit of shadow in there, but not much is going on. Okay. So the why do we call it posse? Again, posse doesn't mean that it's a non-immune process. It's not diabetes or it's not hypertension. It's not a non-immune. It's a definitely immune process going on. And actually, um, first time, I think there was a significant article in 2004. It was uh, published in KI, which shows that there could be scant, very little deposit of IgG or IgM or even C3 
although it's not a major binder of complement system, uh, but not much. So again, uh, it is important to understand the pathogenesis of ANCA vasculitis and its effect on the kidney, because from this, we can deduce why we have certain strategy for hitting certain areas, where, how we can treat this condition. So without understanding the pathology, we will not understand the treatment and what we are trying to do. For our students, genetics, yes, ANCA has HLA. Um, it is related to HLA. Infections, uh, many infections uh, can cause, where it is an assumption that it triggers uh, the ANCA process, how ANCA is coming first. So that an infection can trigger that. Drugs, as Dr. Morrison said, hydrolazine, allopurinol, propyl thyroid, and then levamisole, all these drugs. Minocycline is one. And silica exposure has sort of been proven that it can provoke ANCA formation. Anyways, we're not supposed to form an autoantibody against our own neutrophils, certain elements, but we do have that. Okay, now we know that there are CD4 cells, which is T helper, CD8, T suppressor cell, and then the B cells. So then uh, once the ANCA is formed, then there are ANCA-specific B cells, which then gets transformed into ANCA-specific plasma cells. These plasma cells are in clones, so they produce a lot of ANCA. Then antibodies has FC and FAB portion. So FC portion comes and stimulates the neutrophils. Now, neutrophils get energized here. We call it prime neutrophil. The prime neutrophil, actually, Dr. Mosen very nicely showed that uh, MPO and PR3. But this MPO and PR3 not only gets activated, they are also expressed on the surface. They used to be inside, but they're now, now coming out on the surface. And then the AFAB portion of the ANCA antibody binds to these antigens. And then the FC part will actually invite other neutrophils to come in, or they can actually bind, um, activate the alternate pathway of complement. Now, the prime neutrophils they develop more adhesion molecules. Interestingly, also the endothelial cells also starts having more expression of adhesion molecules. As a result, the prime neutrophil is now attached to the endothelial surface. And thereafter, they degranulate because these are lysosomal granules that get out. And also the MPO and PF3 gets out. They, when they start digesting the normal tissue that is the epithelium and by hydrogen um, peroxide and oxygen free radical, thereafter, this alternate pathway of complement, which is the protein pathway, starts from C3 gets activated. And we know that uh, they also do um, invite other neutrophils to act on. And then this more and more neutrophils are aligning to the in the filial wall, we call it diapedesis. And after breakdown of the cell wall, then it gets through that because of the method called chemotaxis. So we just have a few of the targets here that when we go into the treatment part, this uh, knowledge is gonna be very valuable. Again, we have a uh, complements three pathways. Classic pathway is usually immune complex, like, you know, uh, either cryos or anti um, post streptococcal GN or IgN nephropathy. The lectin pathway is from uh, uh, carbohydrates and then alternate pathway. Alternate pathway of complement is a continuous pathway. It's like a cascade of complement that is continuously activated. It doesn't need any activation. It is continuously uh, C3 hydrolyzation causes uh, like a, it's like a fall, waterfall going continuously. Now, if the waterfall goes continuously, the God must have a system to check it because everything in the nature is in check and balance. Yes, we have factor H and factor I. These two proteins, they are actually trying to control the cascade uh, so that it doesn't get overactive. Now, then it goes, it starts with C3, C3B, and then finally, then C5. At C5 level, it go into membrane attack complex that C5 to nine. Uh, which lyses the cell walls, but then C5A is a chemotactic factor which attracts other neutrophils. 
this area is important. Now, I don't exactly know why certain condition will attract anta and, uh, uh, sorry, certain condition will cause more involvement of the um, immune, uh, certain immune complex disorder will bind more complements and other or not. I don't exactly know that immunobiology, but ANCA is not traditionally known to cause uh, complement activation as much as say post protocol GN, but there is a role in there. But most of the complex binding and also the activity of the immune complex is actually in the bloodstream uh, until the endothelium is severe, then maybe some of the inflammation goes into the glomeruli. Having said that, um, if we go back on the uh, this area, we have endothelium in the top, and then we have the basement membrane, and then we have protocytes. So you see there are so many fenestrated endothelium, but very few protocytes. So actually, each of the glomeruli has only 800 protocytes. And then 400 of the protocytes are dead, the whole glomeruli will collapse, and it's going to be remain non-functional, and it cannot repair itself. Because uh, there was a mass model, it shows that only 2% of the protocytes can replicate, others cannot. Whereas endothelium and the basement membrane, they can be repaired. Now, among the antigen antibody complex, we know that the glomerular basement membrane uh, and the endothelium has negative charge. So most of the antigen antibody complex is positive charge. So that's why there is a uh, tendency of this complex to, to get into, and sometimes they can go up to the, not only the subendothelial, but also can cross the basement membrane and go under the subepithelial level. Here we can see um, a representation of the prime neutrophils breaking through the basement membrane wall and getting out where the lysosomes are going to uh, release into this tissue causes further destruction. This is a nice uh, normal glomeruli. We can see this is after different arterial, you see glomerular basement membrane with um, endothelial endothelium. This is uh, protocytes with the slit pores and see the open space is the bound space. What ANCA vasculitis is gonna do is break through this basement membrane crossing the uh, epithelial layer and stimulate the parietal epithelium of the glomeruli, which then starts proliferating at a rapid rate and causes synechiae, which is uh, the, now the glomerular wall is gonna be connected to the parietal epithelial cell and the uh, outer space that was open, it is not gonna be open anymore. Let's see, there's a normal glomeruli. You can see each of the capillary loop has only two uh, two nucleus. When there is more than two to three, then it is actually proliferation. Here we can see the stepwise uh, progression of crescent formation. This is important to understand for the students because this is the telltale sign of RPGN. The green line here is the basement, and this is the endothelium, and this is the epithelium, and this is the parietal epithelium cells. See, early on, the green line is broken. So the basement membrane is broken, and so inflammatory cells are getting into, and plasma protein is also, fibrin and others are getting into the space outside of the capillary loop. Thereafter, we can see the parietal epithelial cells are proliferating. These are some of the fibroblasts. So we know that the cellular crescent is good because its outcome is good, whereas, Fibrous crescent is not good because it's not going to reverse. Fibrocellular is mixed. And here we can see that there is further progression. We have a lot of fibroblasts, but a lot of epithelial cells. When the crescent is formed, the total glomerulus is pushed. You can see it's trying to collapse now. So this is crescent GM. Again, uh, I can, uh, the prime neutrophils, how they get connected. But so the question is, if we formulate a therapy, where are the targets? First of all, genetics we cannot change, obviously it doesn't happen. If there is any environmental influence, silica exposure, I don't know, somebody who works in a sandblasting industry, maybe they can do it. Obviously you wanna choose your cocaine appropriately so it is not adulterated with loving salt. 
Some of these are hydralazine, minocycline, allopurinol, have high suspicion for those. Thereafter, we are going into T cell and B cell. Now, we think steroid, which is the classic medicine, is a shotgun approach because, as uh, Professor Ali Chaudhary the other day said, that it is uh, lymphopenic, but nitro, it grows the neutrophil. So T and B cells are gone with the shotgun now. That is one approach. Then we are going after the plasma cells. Sorry, B cells. The B cells, we know many of the drugs that we use, including rituximab, uh, then um, cyclophosphamide, then uh, azathioprine, methotrexate, also salcept, uh, mycophenolate will, is anti-B. Plasma cells, yes, we could use something because we, we have uh, multiple myeloma, so we can go after the plasma cell with bortezoma. Then we see the, uh, now it's targeting uh, the, after it has been primed and it has bound the complement, we can use complement binder. So we have a C5A. And then finally, the new kid in the block and something in development that these NK cells are like a, if the Heinz region between FAB and FC portion, uh, they can cut it off, then the immunoglobulin should be ineffective. So these are our targets in general. Again, uh, the crescentic GN, this is the crescent. You can see the normal glomerulite is collapsed. Here, this is mostly a cellular crescent. See how many cells are on outside uh, because of the parietal epithelium has proliferated so much. Actually, in, in this case, in each of the capillary loop, we see some little bit of maybe more than the nucleus that we have. Some of them are neutrophils, actually. Here, we can see fibrous crescent because we have fibrosis in here. There is scar tissue as well as some epithelium. We can see nucleus. Um, so this gentleman, uh, he was a fellow at the National Institute of uh, Immunology so allergy, immunology, and infectious disease in, at NIH in 1971. So because he was also covering infectious disease, he saw a lot of people who uh, comes in with fever of unknown origin, and they have joint pain, and they die very frequently. He's the one that first started using rituximab uh, by the blessing of his boss, and then came up with this protocol, and that was then published in New England Journal of Medicine, in December of 1971. I have the article, and I, I however cannot show it to you because it is a uh, proprietary. So it says effect of cyclophosphamide upon the immune response in Wegener's granulomatosis, published December 30, 1971. The disease that had 80% mortality in those days, so with cytoxin alone, it became a disease that is relapsing and remitting. This was a big landmark. Thanks to Dr. Fauci for his uh, wonderful contributions. And we all know him because of the COVID, of course. Again, we discuss about the targets, where we are gonna, how we are gonna uh, attack this disease. Okay, studies to fight against ANCA, so we struck trigger, anti-B cell, steroid, cytoxin, rituximab, azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate. Anti-plasma cell, bortezomab, we'll talk about that. Remove ANCA antibody, meaning split it off, and then lysis of ANCA antibody and block complement activation. Sorry, removing is plasmapheresis, of course. So uh, Dr. Mozen has nicely said all the studies that have been done, but some of them are all, almost all of them he said is relevant to nephrology as well. Here, I'll just summarize it in two minutes. On the top part is induction. So he borrowed these items from oncology, I think with uh, great relevance. The lower part is the maintenance therapy. Among induction therapy, PEX is a very old study and I couldn't find much about this. MPEX, so uh, it is a therapeutic plasma exchange versus high dose steroid. In this study, the patient who were very sick, they had pulmonary hemorrhage or creatinine was more than 5.7. They had some advantage when thrombotic, uh, sorry, um, we did TPE. Um, interestingly, they did not have those advantage after 12 months, it disappeared. So advantage in terms of saving the kidney or saving the patient's life. So the TPE was not effective after one year and there was slight advantage. So 
sort of a negative trial. Cyclops. So oral versus IV cyclophosphamide. IV cyclophosphamide was more effective in induction period. Oral was better in remission period. However, IV cyclophosphamide had lesser side effect in terms of leukopenia and infection. So, or, uh, so therefore, in the United States, all the nephrologists we use only IV cyclophosphamide most of the time. Then Rave trial, Dr. Mazam nicely said, rituximab versus cyclophosphamide. Unfortunately, they excluded the patient who had created more than four, or they were very sick, like we're having pulmonary hemorrhage. But again, rituximab was shown to be more effective in induction and also remission. And probably has definitely, it was a non-inferiority trial. It was not only non-inferior, probably a little bit better. Then rituximab, again, rituximab with cyclophosphamide. This is a much bigger and nicer study. However, in rituximab arm, patient did get two doses of cyclophosphamide on the first and third dose. So, and then Pexivas, uh, there is a, a plasma exchange uh, study where there was no definitive benefit of uh, therapeutic plasma exchange. Man, but Dr. Mazam did mention about the high dose versus low dose steroid in this. And the lower part is the maintenance. Maintenance is cyclozarm. Cyclophosphamide was just as a thioprene. So cyclo, uh, cyclophosphamide could be safely transitioned to as a thioprene. And patient was still in maintenance remission. So that is, that is uh, the outcome from this trial. Next is Wagent, which is methotrexate versus azathioprine. Methotrexate was more toxic than azathioprine. So that I mean is the winner. Then Impro, mycophenolate versus azathioprine. Again, azathioprine is the winner because there was better outcome in maintenance. And then mainstream, rituximab, Dr. Mozum said, rituximab was better than azathioprine and retizarin was the same. So basically, if we can afford it, Rituximab probably is the best medicine for maintenance therapy, but if we cannot, then azathioprine is probably can be used. So if only for Dr. Mazam, KDGO is an international body and it is highly regarded. They do a lot of research and they give us the guidelines for many of the glomerular disease. And it's very useful uh, because the guidelines are not only based on uh, countries that can afford a lot of drugs, it's mostly for everybody else. So we use it. So, there is like 2023 guideline, but I summarized this in three slides. Okay, do you go practice points. Again, induction therapy, either cyclophosphamide with glucocorticoid or rituximab with glucocorticoid. Maintenance therapy, rituximab or other thioprene with low dose steroid. I think they may, most people think that we should be able to taper off the steroid to five milligrams in 16 weeks. Duration of maintenance therapy, this is KDGO's position, 18 months to four years after induction of remission. Then indication for therapeutic plasma exchange, TPE or some people call it PLEX, Considered therapeutic plasma exchange, obviously the big one is overlapping anti-GBM. We have anti-GBM plus MPO or PF3 anchor, or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, or if the serum creatinine is more than 3.4, or they're requiring dialysis because rapidly rise of creatinine. So factors that increase relapse risk. This is Kedigo's position. We heard from uh, Dr. Mozen that in rheumatology, they don't use it as much. But this is Kedigo's position, PR3 and subtype. I think this is the worst disease prognosis. They do think that that is helpful. Remaining ANCA positive at the end of the induction, rising ANCA titer, lower cyclophosphamide exposure, lower serum creatinine. I'm not sure why this is. Anyways, the thing is, this disease does relapse. Even in best case scenario, in four years, even if you have used rituximab, 20% patient is going to relapse. If we don't use rituximab, if we use azathioprine, 40, 50% patient will relapse in four years. So we have to have high suspicion and close follow-up so that we can catch those relapsing patients. 
maybe ANCA is useful in that situation. And so rituximab versus azathioprine, what is KDG's position? Azathioprine, which is more affordable, low availability of rituximab, it could be applicable in our country as well, low baseline IgG, which is less than 300 milligrams per DL, probably because then B cell is not as active. That is my guess. Hepatitis B positive. Rituximab, PR3 ANCA, should try to use it. Relapsing disease, frail and the old, and glucocorticoid sparing. Now, next is almost when, why rituximab is such a big deal? Because this, not only the studies have shown, but 99% of the CD20 B cells are gone in three months of induction. Yes, it is slow to start working, but 99% of the CD20 is gone. Now that is amazing. And less than 10% of the CD20 is back in six months. But by one year, about 90% of the CD20 is back. So I guess we, if we have financial constraint, we could possibly monitor the CD20. Maybe the patient doesn't need another dose of rituximab in six months. Maybe he needs in nine months. We could follow the CD20. Uh, however, I don't know how much it costs to check the CD20. Cannot do plasma exchange right after. So patient comes in, patient has massive uh, crescents. Uh, if the crescent is more than 50%, cellular crescent, in five-year recovery is about 75% chance. If they have fibrous crescent and fibrosis uh, of more than 50% in the glomeruli, then five-year recovery is less than 25%. Now, we sometimes do a cytoxin and we want to do plasma exchange. Maybe say patient has pulmonary hemorrhage or is uh, mixed with the anti-GBM. If we give rituximab and you do plex right after, then the plex is going to remove the rituximab so it's not going to work. So we have to um, we keep it in mind. It has been shown to cause low immunoglobulin and poor immune response, especially during COVID time. People who are treated with rituximab within six months, their immune response is very, very poor. So I always give back to prophylaxis for um, um, PCP pneumonia, that is pneumocystic carrying pneumonia. That is very pricey. Even in uh, Bangladesh, it's cost, I think, about 50,000 taka. And um, the limitation of this is, we saw that there is T cells, T helper cell stimulating the B cell. The B cells will then become plasma cells. So it can block the B cells by blocking CD20, but it cannot block plasma cells and it cannot block the antibodies. So therefore, it is slow to start working. So we use a shotgun approach like pulse steroid and probably rituximab. And many studies have actually, it's also in Harvard protocol, have used that. So I recently heard this IgG endopeptidase. So, you know, all these IgGs, that anti-IgGs. So if you use a splicing agent, the endopeptide, it can splice with the hinge region where the FAB and FC connect. In two hours after using uh, this drug, imlifidase, and in four hours, you see they are spliced. So they are, they are not there anymore. So that's very interesting. Uh, it is currently in phase three trial for, I think, lupus. However, in one study in Europe, I think in Portugal, 58% of the patients had to be taken off of the trial because of serious side effects. So that didn't work very well. So uh, Avakupan, uh, Dr. Walker Mazum already said that, I'm not gonna say that. So take home messages have a high level of suspicion for ANCA vasculitis. Do, forget about the, RPG and definition, the days, two weeks. We don't have days, two weeks to save the kidney because we need to think like the cardiologist. So door to balloon is 90 minutes. So here we, time is glomeruli, early diagnosis, especially by kidney biopsy. Kidney biopsy is important. This is not our PLA2R for uh, like membranous. ANCA is not like PLA2R. Even if the patient has ANCA, it is always biopsy that determines how aggressive we have to be and what is going to be the prognosis. Start treatment as soon as possible, induction with pulse steroid, cyclophosphamide, 
uh, maintenance therapy as a therapy. And this would probably be more practical for our country. And maintenance duration is, I think, 24 to 48 months. And please be mindful about the relapse. And uh, this patient should come for follow-up. Relapse should be treated accordingly. So thank you. So um, Nafisa, we have three uh, questions. So we will do those three questions. And after then, we can get a discussion. So this is uh, exclusively for the fellows. So if we, uh, uh, whoever has the uh, best, most right answers, will get the prize. So let's start those questions. And uh, Nafisa, you keep a tab. Okay, question one, low complement level is not a typical feature of which of these conditions? Not a typical feature. A, lupus nephritis, B, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, C, cryoglobulinemia, D, IgA nephropathy. We have one minute to answer. Anyone? Sir, IG and approved. Okay. So, uh, Nafisa, please note. Sorry, uh, Kingra. Uh, yeah. Sir, chat box answer to the hobby. Chat box to show the answer to the answer. Please put the answers in the chat box so that Nafisa knows who you are. Kindly put the answer in the chat box. Doctor, please. You're right, it is IG nephropathy. Good job. As you know, the, uh, the NK and PR3 and also, they, they will not uh, lower the complement levels. The classic is uh, post infectious GN. Uh, did, you, did you answer on the doctor? Did you put it in the chat box? Just, just give your put your answer in the chat box, so then you get credit for that. Navisa, did he answer in the chat box? Sir, oh, only answer for it. Chen, but only answer for it again. Short answer ta arbish ko ek juni answer kore fit chen chat box. Okay, okay. Next one, again, please answer in the chat box, okay? We're gonna to go to the next question. Okay, let's see. Okay, which of these renal cells are less likely to regenerate? Less likely to regenerate. Fenestrated endothelium, photocytes with slit pore diaphragm, parietal epithelial cells, mesangial cell. We have a minute to answer. Nafisa, do you have a do do you have an answer? Yes, sir. Thank you. Great job. Then last question. Sir, need to question a short answer to give up. Oh, so shall I take answer hello? B, photocytes with slit put diaphragm. Because okay, I told in, in the talk that only two to three percent, these are very, very highly differentiated cells. Only two to three percent will ever, was, was shown in a mouse model to regenerate. He actually does not regenerate, that's the problem. Question number three, I'll read this. A 20-year-old woman presents with asthma beginning two years ago, which requires daily steroid inhaler use. She now has recurrent sinusitis, pulmonary infiltrates, a left foot drop, and peripheral eosinophilia of 6,700. That is more than 50% of her total leukocytes. It's a lot of eosinophilia. She undergoes 
AFIP1L1PDGFR alpha. Dr. Moza, what is this? AFIP1L, what is this? AFIP1L1PDGFR, what is this? These are the tests for diagnosis of the, uh, 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 you know, um, so, um, Transfers? Yes. Charles Strauss. So why is this such a big name? You can come up with a smaller no, name. No, I'm sorry, not Charles Strauss. Not Charles Strauss. It's a long, uh, I think it's a pulmonary, uh, I'm not having that in the top of my mind, but it's a pulmonary test. Something related. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay. Which is negative and infection, whatever it is, it is negative. So don't worry about that. And infectious evaluation, including parasites are unrevealing. So patient has sinusitis, pulmonary inflammation, left foot drop that is not pulsy, peripheral eosinophilia. Okay, good. Then what? Which of the following is most closely associated with the worst disease prognosis? Elevated IgE, peripheral eosinophilia more than 20%, elevated troponin I, Positive P anka slash MPO anka. Just for you to, sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I just asked the question right away and I was a little startled. So it's basically a, a hematology condition where you have an un, um, uh, unopposed production of platelet. So that's what it is. Okay. Thank you. You got us. None of us knew that. So great. Okay. So uh, students, you have another minute to answer this question. Nafisa, do you have an answer? Yes, sir, we got so many. Please uh, let us know the right answer. Uh, uh, Dr. Mazen, please tell what condition this patient has. I have covered that in my slides. So basically, this is a uh, the answer would be D because if you can remember in EG um, in the uh, in Charles Strauss disease, if you have a positive ANCA, it's always MPO ANCA, which is a P ANCA with N MPO activity, and that's what uh, that's why the answer is D. So the D is the uh, uh, the right answer for quiz number three and for quiz number uh, two is a port B, B as in boy is the right answer and quiz number one, the D as in David was the right answer. So who is the winner? Sir, I have next texted you the name. Oh, you have texted me the name? Yes. Okay, let me see. Mm. Let me see. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Sharmin, congratulations. You are the winner of today's quiz. Um, great job. Wonderful. Dr. Sharmin, could you? So, Nafisa, you need her um, address or information? Yes, sir. I need her address, phone number, and mail address. Please. How is she going to give it to you? In chat box, sir. In chat box. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Sharmin, congrats. Uh, please uh, share that. Uh, one interesting thing is that this Shrug Strauss, I thought, why is such a heavy name? Then I found out that in 1951, they actually invented this ANCA, these two different people. So maybe that. Anyways, um, thank you so much. Uh, so again, uh, the audience, uh, great participation on our two days program was organized by Planetary Health Academia, thanks to the organizers. And also uh, uh, we are very thankful to our sponsors in SEPTA and United Hospital. I'm going to uh, the, our respected um, uh, Professor Ayavali Chaudhary. Um, 
if you could just say a few words about our presentation and then lead the discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Islam. Uh, it was a, a nice uh, time with uh, everybody. And everyone, we are, we are talking with uh, unassociated vasculitis. Uh, first, I must congratulate Sayyid Bakarul Muazzam for his brilliant presentation on uncastled vasculitis. And in fact, uh, in fact, uh, the rheumatologists are dominating uh, this uh, anka uh, management of anka vasculitis uh, in Bangladesh also, and, and also uh, a good presentation from excellent presentation from. And Dr. Islam, the, he has covered the pathogenesis and the management part from the nephrology point of view. <clears throat> In fact, if we consider a patient of anka associated vasculitis, the patient can belong to a dermatologist, the patient can belong to a rheumatologist, patient can belong to a nephrologist. So uh, everybody has their own way of uh, thinking when we have way of presentation and uh, different approaches to the management. And if I can remember correctly, first ANCA term was known to me in the year 1993-94. And then uh, the first case of ANCA vasculitis uh, that I, uh, I saw, it was at that time, it was known as Wegener's granomatosis. It was referred to us by the professor of ENT, uh, he has seen the patient and then he was uh, uh, some bizarre symptom and then it was referred to us from the ENT department. So you see that uh, this actually, uh, the patient can present to many a specialty. And then uh, uh, the, uh, just a few words that Dr. Islam has rightly emphasized that one should suspect but there, there are many cases, many patients present with pyrexia of unknown origin, patient with joint pain, having anorexia, nausea, fever, and going from door to door, door to door, before finally it is seen that one, if one examines the urine properly, if the urine is show, showing microscopic hematuria and some, some slight deterioration of renal function, and then presenting with multi-system disease, one should suspect that, am I dealing with a case of ungastrous vasculitis or not? So uh, the, the suspicion, clinical suspicion, and thinking of a possibility that it could be ungastrous vasculitis is the main important first step to cleanse the diagnosis. And uh, I, should, I, should, I think I should, uh, shall be, should be brief uh, that the presentation I, I noticed that the pathogenesis is a very complex process. Uh, recently, there has been uh, genome-wide association studies that have identified multiple genetic predisposing variants, then pathogen role of ANCA. And also, uh, interesting is that B cell is likely to play a major role in the pathogenesis because the, they produce ANCA. And also, uh, the role of alternative complement pathway uh, has been established more recently. <clears throat> and the studies of the antagonist of human C5A receptor, that is Abhacopan, uh, have just been completed with the promising very much results. So the current uh, standard treatment of severe uncastled vasculitis is still consists of remission induction therapy with steroid combined with, with rituximab is the standard care, of, uh, care at present and less often with the cyclophosphamide. And uh, several studies have shown that reduced dose regime of glucocorticoid are non-inferior to the previously used heavy uh, use of steroid. And uh, abhocapone may use may lead, may lead to new steroid-free therapeutic approaches uh, in some selected patients. And uh, as regards the maintenance therapy, several tri trials have shown uh, superiority of rituximab over azathioprine or methotrexate as the maintenance therapy. But the uh, optimal dose duration regime uh, for maintenance treatment is, is yet to be defined. 
at least we should individualize our patient uh, who need to continue beyond 24 months four months or more. And many changes have occurred in the standard care and we are uh, more expected. And uh, there are many uh, agents uh, under investigations. So with these words, I would like to uh, stop my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ayurveda Lali Chaudhary. Now I'll go to Professor Babur Lallam, Director of National Institute of Kidney Disease and Neurology uh, for his uh, comments. Thank you, Imtiaz Bhai. Uh, at first, I would like to thank my uh, elder brother, Prof, uh, Dr. Wakarul Mahajim. is very known to me, and uh, I am very much delighted to see him in, uh, in, in this platform. And uh, also thanks, uh, uh, Wakarul Bhai, there is an excellent presentation, no doubt, and a very brief presentation. And as a uh, rheumatologist, you have uh, discussed every things. Uh, uh, Dr. Imtiaz Bhai al uh, already mentioned uh, about the renal uh, limited uh, vasculitis that uh, we usually deal as a nephrologist. And uh, 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 I, I have a question to uh, Walker Bhai uh, that uh, uh, Euler uh, already recommends uh, the early uh, switching of uh, glucocorticoid within uh, four to uh, five, uh, fifth month uh, just to reduce our uh, prednisolone five milligram. Uh, do you have any comments uh, regarding this uh, recommendation? And you know the abacopen uh, uh, is a very rare drug and it is not uh, um, common in Bangladesh. It is an alternative to um, uh, glucocorticoid therapy. Uh, and uh, as a maintenance dose, uh, Imtiaz Bhai already mentioned that maintenance we should uh, go for as a therapy. And, but uh, do you have any idea about uh, methotrexate? Uh, for maintenance therapy, as you are already recommend for this. Uh, Majum, uh, Walker, can you tell me the, about the glucocoid sparing? Yes, so the answer to first question about the ULAR, yes, the goal is always to reduce the dose um, as much as possible by five milligrams. You know, five milligram. Sometimes off the prednisone, that's actually the goal. The, the problem is in real world, uh, without the use of um, uh, steroid sparing agents, it's hard to achieve. So yes, uh, I mean, sometimes you can, and it, it, that's, that's cool, and you, you learn is uh, uh, right, but uh, can it, uh, how do we achieve that? Uh, to, to answer your second question, um, yes, I mean, yeah, in Bangladesh, I know that uh, the rutoximab is not available, um, in our country, we use rutoximab. As I said, I have few vasculitis patients. They are still getting rutoximab. And two of my patients are getting Imuran, basically, uh, as a therapy. Uh, methotrexate you, uh, is compared to Imuran. Um, it's not as good as Imuran, but yes, you can use it, especially in the uh, milder cases, like, you know, if you have a sinus uh, involvement or just uh, eye scleritis, those kind of cases, you can get by with methotrexate. And it, it works like um, uh, 15 to 20, you can bump up the dose up to 25. So yes, um, for practice in Bangladesh where, you know, rutoximab is not widely available, the ideal, you should try Imuran first. And um, if it is the milder disease, like uh, as I said, just sinusitis or uh, uh, nasal septum uh, um, involvement or even scleritis, I think uh, you can get by with methotrexate as well. Did I answer that question? Or yes. You... Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Walker Bhai. Uh, I have a, uh, just few days ago, I have deal a patient. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, we have found a 26 old gentleman who presented with leg swelling for one and a half month along with decreased urine output and he uh, he was uh, non-diabetic 
uh, normotensive and he was no history of joint pain, rash, sore throat, or no uh, offending uh, medication intake and or coughing out blood. His urine uh, RE report shows uh, albumin 3 plus uh, RBC plenty with RBC cast and after admission his serum creatinine was increasing rapidly and we have done renal biopsy and start treatment of uh, with IV, IV methylprednisolone that is one gram uh, for three days followed by oral steroid he had nephrotic range proteinuria his auto antibody profile and a hepatitis b and c was negative uh, we have done uh, renal biopsy and he uh, shows crescentic GN along with uh, linear deposition of IgG and his antibody uh, against uh, antibody anti GBM antibody was negative. So, um, so we have uh, labeled that case a, a atypical anti GBM disease. I uh, I want a question. I ask a question to uh, Imtiaz Bhai. Uh, do you have any comments regarding an atypical anti GBM uh, disease? So uh, the anti GBM by Eliza was negative, but the biopsy shows that anti GBM is staining. Are you treated as an anti GBM? But I'm a little confused that why the ELISA is negative. I think I would do is I would repeat the ELISA, but I'll start treating the patient like you're doing. Does this patient have pulmonary hemorrhage as well? No, no. There's no uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, he's uh, uh, no history of any taking uh, offending drugs uh, or uh, no history of joint pain, rash, sore throat, etc. Yeah, he's, uh, I'll treat it aggressively, he's like you said, with, with the induction and uh, cyclophosphamide and all these things. But I'm a little surprised that the patient has nephrotic range proteinuria. Typically, yeah, yeah. when they have anti-GVM disease, they don't have nephrotic range proteinuria. Yeah, there the is nephrotic presentation are, usually. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really, really surprised. Maybe there's, uh, is, this, is this on I, top I, of the IGs? It is our, uh, um, we have uh, published a case report to our journal recently uh, that is uh, atypical anti-GBM disease. We have leveled this patient at uh, atypical anti-GBM disease. Do you have any comments uh, regarding this? Hmm. So um, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little confused why this patient has so much of uh, proteinuria. How many grams do you remember? How many grams? How many grams of protein? Uh, 3.5 grams, more than 3.5 grams. Wow. It is a, a completely and, atypical presentation. And But we didn't do the electron microscope because we yeah. don't have it. Electron microscope was done? No, no. Uh, yeah, electron microscope wasn't uh, possible. You know, it is uh, there is a scarcity of electron microscope. So right now, I think a Brigadier Journal is doing it. If we preserve the slide, we can send it to Brigadier Journal. A look okay. at under electron microscope. Then I think we'll have a little more information about this because it seems like a this this seems like a photocyte disorder because why this has so much of uh, proteinuria and uh, the linear GVM and having anti GVM ELISA is negative. We can repeat the ELISA, but ask yeah. regular journal to do another another one. Yeah, I I have repeated three times. Uh, and it's all negative. All negatives. Hmm, that's interesting. I don't know, Nurluda, any idea? Nurluda, you, you please unmute. Un unmute you. Nurluda, why unmute for him? Achha, actually, I'm going to be able to get up to the boost of our name. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get up to the boost of our name. There is a patient that came in with nephrotic range proteinuria, 3.5 grams, rapid rise of creatinine like RPGN. The biopsy shows like a immunofluorescence and the biopsy shows the- uh, Anti-GBM like antibody was negative. But in the serum, the ELISA anti-GBM antibody is negative. And C3, C4, Cianca, Pianca, everything was negative. But in the biopsy, they, they show the linear deposit of immunofluorescence. 
but they can actually do ELISA on the biopsy specimen and see whether this is anti GBM or not. No. They can do, they can do that. They still can do it. Another thing is maybe we can send the slide to obligatory journal, look it under electron microscope because it is typically only, anti GBM. Only, only, only one thing is uh, in favor of anti GBM linear deposit. Otherwise, right. otherwise, uh, nephrotic grains proteinuria is goes against it because right. uh, in case of uh, anti GBM disease is really sub nephrotic proteinuria less than two gram is really uh, right. so that's why it is very uh, confusing uh, this anti GBM disease or not <laughs> so may I comment please I think I think it, 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 we can conclude it by <coughs> doing electron microscopy okay somebody has a comment please go ahead Sir, I'm a the patient to general biopsy for an antithesis of the bacillitis. In our report, it's an IgG linear accentuation slow. So, I mean, I'm a histopathologist, beginning general journal, sir, I'm a phone deal. Sir, I'm a diabetic nephropathy. It's a linear data. The patient has diabetes? No, no. He's the uh, non diabetic, no, normal test. Yeah, this patient doesn't have diabetes. So, so I I guess on um, uh, uh, the light is a ribbon light to sir. When it has uh other than yet you know ash the body, sorry, when sorry comment, which is pathologist. But you know you typically ancavasculitis doesn't have nephrotic range for new day either. So this is a little confusing. I think EM will give us some other idea. So I'll go to Professor Kazi Alam Shanur. Professor Shanur, please make any uh, have any comments on our presentation and if you have any input on this particular case. Uh, thank you, MKS Bhai. Uh, thanks to uh, Planetary Health Academy for inviting me. And uh, also uh, special thanks to Dr. Wakar Mazem for his nice presentation, as well as the presentation of MKS Bhai. We have learned a few new things. In fact, uh, I don't have any idea about uh, Levamisol vasculopathy. Uh, it's totally new to me, uh, so I learned things uh, from Dr. Wakar. Uh, very interesting. And uh, regarding the uh, um, RPGN, uh, um, in case I rightly mentioned, there are uh, uh, basically three types, anti-GBM disease, immune complex mediated, and post-immune. But in our clinical practice in Bangladesh, uh, many times we found another entity that is idiopathic RPGN. We, uh, the, all the uh, serological workups are negative in these cases. Uh, neither ANCA is positive, nor the NTGBM is positive, uh, or the um, uh, it is uh, the immune complex related disease like uh, lupus screening. Uh, all are negative, but the patient presents and with, after, after uh, excluding RPGN. infection also uh, RPGN. So it's very interesting. Um, I think uh, we don't have uh, enough uh, investigation facilities. That's why we might have missed these cases, you know, which is the special type of uh, uh, RPGN. And another thing is that in our clinical practice, uh, I have seen few, very few cases of uh, ANCA positive vasculitis, but most of them I have seen, they are the PNCA positive. Uh, that is the MPO, MPO ANCA, MPO uh, in, uh, uh, positive ANCA disease. Uh, um, that is the GPA or galvanomatosis and polyan that is, uh, is very rare. But uh, I have seen one case of PNK positive vasculitis even in patient getting dialysis. Uh, he, he was a diabetic uh, and a hypertensive patient. Uh, after getting six months of uh, dialysis, um, she presented. He presented with the features of uh, vasculitis that is uh, the urea. Um, and, uh, and ultimately investigated and found to have uh, PNK positive disease. So these are the, some rare cases. Uh, and another thing is that uh, regarding the treatment uh, uh, for the kind information to Wakar Mazem, uh, rituximab is available in our country, uh, but <laughs> we cannot use this uh, because of financial constraint. Uh, for our uh, in uh, uh, hospital and uh, government hospital, especially uh, our hematologist is using uh, uh, the rituximab uh, very frequently, 
but in our nephrological setup, uh, our treatment is straightforward for uncapped associated disease or any other type of GA, RPGN. That is, we imbue, uh, induction is done by methylprednisolone and cyclophosphamide, IV cyclophosphamide, followed by maintenance with low dose steroid and uh, ESA. This is, the, this is the common uh, pattern of treatment for our RPGN cases. Uh, whether it is uncapped positive or the uh, uh, idiopathic type. And, uh, and the last one is you have rightly mentioned that the, we should ask the two tests for diagnosing uh, uncapped vasculitis. That is, one is indirect immunofluorescence, and the second one is uh, ELISA, that is, uh, enzyme immunoassay. Um, in most of our, but the specific test is MPO antibody, NT, MPO antibody and NTPR3 antibody. Uh, I think um, uh, this test is not available in most of our centers. Yeah, uh, but you know, the thing is, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. The, without actually, uh, if you don't do the ELISA, yes. then if you go to my slide, you'll see that uh, it's not very uh, diagnostic. You yes. Have have ELISA. Yes, I am. And the other thing is, um, uh, for uh, you mentioned about these uh, most cases of the renal involvement, you call P and positivity, which is yeah. MPO, and that's most of the time because you know Wagner's or G, uh, um, EGPA um, only like fifteen to twenty percent cases you have renal involvement, um, so that's why you don't see uh, Wagner uh, with a lot of renal involvement. It's the MPO and the renal limited disease. Um, they are the one who have most of the time um, more renal involved. Yes, thank you. So uh, with these few words, I'd like to um, stop. Uh, other panelists here are here. Uh, thank you, MPS Bhai. So, Dr. Huda, MPSY is not in the seat. Well, she's not there. <laughs> so, do you have any comment? <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, pro uh, Professor Wakar, my friend. And I'm not professor like you, so <laughs> call me just <laughs> Hey, Huda, bhai, apne Wakar, bhai, Ashanur, bhai, same year, mate. Wakar, you are a bachelor. So, uh, so uh, for are you there, Professor Mubashir Alam? Shanu, okay, Professor Shanu. Professor Mubashir, put your love. He is in practice. Okay. Nah, nah, he is in practice. Huda bhai bolte se MTS bhai ya kam. Na, ami jono shuru kori nai. Shuru dhanay, tui bola gaya hai, pora bolbo shuru dhanay. Mubashir. Ji, yes. Me acho acho tiki se, Huda dhanay to shish koro. I am going to start with you. I am going to start with you. No, no, I am going Thank you, uh, Mod, uh, Wakar, for a nice presentation. Actually, uh, we learned a lot from your presentation. As well as uh, Dr. Mtiazbhai, also uh, presented very elaborately. And Kavasculitis, both of you. Wakar present. Uh, the angle of uh, rheumatology and interest way from the corner of nephrology. I always uh, tell my resident, uh, if we think that uh, acute MI or coronary syndrome, minute means muscle. And I always tell RPGN is minute means uh, nephron or glomerulus, whatever it is. So you cannot uh, wait for this. If you think it is RPGN, you should uh, start the treatment, don't delay, and do the biopsy, and wait for the report from biopsy. If biopsy is negative, then you can switch or stop your treatment. But uh, there's no harm. You will uh, uh, treat over treatment for four or five days, uh, but you can save a life. Because uh, within 14 days, uh, fibrosis starts and within 21 to 30 days fibrosis stopped so kidney is gone within 21 to 30 days so you have to save the kidney or salvage the kidney within 14 days so you don't have to be wait 
And another thing for my, our resident, how you uh, diagnose uh, for resident, if this is a kidney involvement, you think always it is MPA or GPA, more likely. If it is skin or cutaneous involvement, you think IgA vasculitis or cryoglobin uh, vasculitis. And if it, if it is lie involvement, you think mostly it may be due to GPA or EGPA and sometimes MPA. So for, uh, from the organ involvement, you can think which may be the uh, cause. Another, uh, Shanur uh, nicely mentioned that our treatment is same, whatever the diagnosis. If it is anka <laughs> positive or negative, our treatment is same actually. This is true. In, because we cannot prescribe uh, rituximab, it is very costly. Though uh, abocapan, uh, cyclophosphamide, and a lot of uh, IB cyclophosphamide, uh, uh, methylprednisolone, we all only use uh, as induction methylprednisolone and cyclophosphamide. And as a maintenance, sometimes cyclophosphamide and uh, prednisolone or, 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 or azathiprine or prednisolone. But a lot of studies, uh, uh, I, I have uh, I, I just gone through today uh, about uh, uh, hydralazine causes uh, MPO positive MPO positive uh, vasculitis and and a lot of drugs uh, also but hydralazine is more commonly used in uh, our practice and not in Bangladesh but uh, outside Bangladesh our lot of Patients from Middle East, they come with uh, come to us with hydralazine as an antihypertensive. And sometimes uh, other patient, uh, the, the worker mentioned about uh, another drug, uh, I think. Uh, uh, Propyl thiourocil. No, no, about uh, uh, PR3. And, and minocycline, minocycline. Minocycline also causes, yeah, yeah but no PR3, PR3 positive. PR3 positive, another drug you also mentioned. Oh, Livamizole. is commonly used in our country, but uh, Livamizole uh, with, uh, I think, another uh, addiction addiction drug they use. It. Cocaine, with cocaine. Cocaine, cocaine yeah. probably cocaine. Yeah, yeah so basically one happened. Cocaine, uh, in, in, our country, in our country, Libaminizole is not used with cocaine. So there is no chance of vasculitis, PR3 positive vasculitis in our country. Uh, because Libaminizole only used for antihelminthic purpose. Mm -hmm. So and that even should not be used that much because it's not a very good drug. Thanks. No, actually cocaine is not doing the vasculitis. Yeah, it's the liver it's on that because cocaine is expensive when it comes from South America to America to increase the volume they were adding some white powder somebody oh, found liver missile that's they that's thought that's that's it increases that's the that's efficacy that's of the cocaine oh, so therefore they had 10 percent cocaine with nine, 90 percent cocaine 10 percent liver missile but liver missile itself can cause and vasculitis, isn't that right? Yes, actually, it's the it's, it's the liver measles that caused the vasculitis, not the. Oh, that, but we don't have any report about liver measles causes vasculitis. I, actually, we don't know about it. That may be the question. <laughs> another thing is, uh, as maintenance therapy, another in a, in single study they use uh, cotrim cotrimoxazole, that is sulfamethoxazole, uh, trimethoprime. Uh, as a maintenance therapy, but, though, but it is it was not found significant. Uh, if it was found significant, that was uh, another uh, that may be a cheaper option for us. But uh, there is uh, this study doesn't mean any significance. But still, we have only as a theprim or cyclophosphamide and has uh, as a maintenance therapy. Question is how long? Is eighteen months, four years, or lifelong? That is the question. Uh, and sometimes uh, patient goes to ESRD. How and when we have to stop the uh, this maintenance therapy? Is there any cutoff point of serum creatinine to stop the uh, maintenance therapy? That is our that is the another issue. Uh, I finally I ask this question to Imtiaz Bhai. What is the serum creatinine or GFR to stop the maintenance therapy in uh, uh, vasculitis? The last week, two of my encarvasculitis <laughs> patients somehow they showed up in the clinic. I didn't. Uh, I only checked their urine. Urine under microscope. 
uh, and uh, the, the for protein. So they didn't have protein and under microscopes and their creatinine was stable. I've been seeing them every six months. I noticed that uh, there are some recommendations to see them every three months, but these people have been in remission for the last, so I, I treated them overall for two years, both of them. One is an MPO and the one is PR3, but they don't have any systemic features. If they had systemic features, then I would have them follow with a rheumatologist. But because they don't have any system features, only I follow them. But I'm seeing them every six months. I check the urine and the chemistry, and there uh, I have advised them to check their blood pressure at home. If I had suspicion that patient had difficulty coming back or patient may not show up, I'd give them some albumin strips or, or uh, RBC strips so they can check if it turns positive, then they will call me. That is how we've been following them. No, uh, my question was, uh, when you stop the therapy, what is the creatinine? Oh, when I stop the therapy? Uh, GFR level, you can stop the therapy, maintenance therapy. What is the GFR or creatinine level? Obviously, obviously, there was some chronicity in these people because the biopsy shows some chronicity because they are not like a 20-year-old. Usually, they, you know, this bio model. Both of my patients are more than 55 years old. They had other disease and hypertension especially. So they have some chronicity. But the creatinine had settled at maybe say 1.6, 1.7, and I accepted that. And I they, they then I, after two years they were not on any because they had no proteinuria. There was uh, the creatinine was stable, the blood pressure was stable. They didn't have any systemic features. I, I was listening to a lecture in NIH. They say that people who have antivasculitis, the patient themselves can tell you a few months ahead that they are having the disease coming back. I don't know how. The symptoms like uh, those uh, like um, uh, constitutional symptoms, like low grade fever, the fatigue and others. It is so characteristic that when they tell them, you check their labs or it, the disease has actually come back. I also do not follow their uh, anchor, but I thought maybe it's not a bad idea. Maybe if we check the, uh, that uh, MP or PR3 uh, once in a while, maybe every six months. It's not a bad idea. I started checking that now. And, and actually, um, a professor from Harvard, Mass General Hospital, have done a study. So a study shows that they followed the CD20 and they also followed the ANCA and seen for the maintenance therapy and see which one coordinates better with the clinical uh, presentation and, and if they treat it. They saw that following CD20 was better than following ANCA. I mean, there is some utility in following ANCA, but following CD20 was better. I think they've done study over like three, four years in terms of relapse and outcome. But they all use rituximab, obviously. Regarding uh, regarding test in our country also do uh, ELISA that is PR three or MPU nowadays most of the laboratory now special uh, big laboratory like uh, in Chirong Chevron or any big laboratory they are doing uh, ELISA that is uh, they are doing PR three or MPU nowadays uh, in direct fluorescence I think uh, small laboratories are doing like that but. Most of the big laboratories are doing ELISA. Thank you, uh, Professor Nanduda. We'll go to Professor Mavashir Alumna. Mavashir, are you still yeah, yeah. in the office? Uh, uh, thank you, Imtiaz Bhai. I have to congratulate both speakers, Dr. Moadjam and Imtiaz Bhai, for their nice and brilliant presentation. Also, my previous panelists for their discussion. I have two questions uh, to Dr. Imtiaz Bhai. If there is a uh, any uh, idea, or uh, we noted the two RCT trial uh, remission of induction by injection rituximab and uh, cyclophosphamide. Do you have any idea that their uh, remission rate dual therapy in injection rituximab and injection cyclophosphamide? So the question is, if we induce them with rituximab and cyclophosphamide, which was actually the uh, uh, rituximab trial, I think they, I told you that they, although there was rituximab, but in first and third dose, they also got cyclophosphamide. That is how the trial was. 
in best case scenario, over four year time, most, even with using dutrixumab, the relapse rate is about 20%. Relapse rate is 20%. And then if you do azathioprine, it's 40% in good trials. So, and if you, uh, sporadic treatment, obviously it could be 80%. The relapse rate is very, very high actually. Within good situation, it is 20%. 20%, okay. And, and another question is, what is asymptomatic ankyloidosis? This question should go to Wakan Mazdan. Okay, Wakan. Yeah, I'm not aware of any asymptomatic ankyloidosis. I mean, you have to have symptoms. Uh, you can have a positive anka, but it's, uh, in, in rheumatology, uh, we don't, we have, you have to have, the, the tests are important, but you have to have symptoms. The tests are good so, in the- So let's, let's rephrase the question. What are the reasons, Professor Mazam, for false positive ANCA? Yeah, so uh, as I have said, the false positive ANCA would be your, uh, in one of my slides, I did address that, that if you have an infection uh, or drug induced. Uh, like the um, 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 Dr. Huda uh, mentioned, hydralazine, uh, quite commonly used in your country, and then uh, well, thyroxine, uh, mon, uh, uh, and the minocycline. They so those have the drug and they have the symptoms, though, isn't it? Yes, they, they, all, all of them have to have symptoms. You cannot have, no, I mean, I'm is sure it if there might be. Anka, hmm? Is it possible to have NK positive, just NK by immunofluorescence, not MP1 mm -hmm. P3? Only ANCA positive, but they don't have any symptoms at all. Yeah, then it's not. Because, you yeah. know, if you look at my first slide, it's that you to diagnose ANCA-associated anti vasculitis. That's why we spend time on the IFA and ELISA. If one of them is positive, so let, let, if you, um, let me open the, um, I think, um, so let's go, uh, show you this uh, slide, then you will have a better understanding. Um, and that actually is very important for the, uh, Go, uh, for the students as well, who will be the uh, primary care uh, or internal medicine. So if you look at this slide, um, can you see that? No, you have to share that. So. You have to share. In drug-induced ANCA positivity, there are also histonal and histone also positive there. So, but in case of GPA or MPA, and histone will not be the positive. But if you have bacterial endocarditis and you have ANCA, you won't have any renal involvement in there. But you have so, symptoms from bacterial endocarditis. Yeah, so this is the important slide. So if you look at that, you have to have both positivity. If it is if one is positive, like if you, you have an ANCA, but you, it's, you don't have a, a PR3 or MPO, then that diagnostic then test is not very useful diagnostic test. Okay, so to address, to your answer your question. So if you have a uh, drug-induced vasculitis, for example, then you will have always the, most of the time, and I mean, it's pretty much always, the p anchor with MPO, that's drug-induced. But in, in drug-induced uh, uh, vasculitis, you will have to have symptoms. Like your patient will come to you and give you some symptoms, some constitutional symptoms or, you know, vasculitic rash, or ne ne neurological symptom like wrist drop, foot drop. But if you just, uh, just somebody is on hydralazine or just somebody is on propyl thyroxine and you just do a test and it come back positive ANCA, it doesn't mean the patient has ANCA associated vasculitis. It's like lupus, like, you know, you, ha you have to have symptom uh, to get diagnosis of lupus. So in other words, uh, one can have ANCA positive uh, even MPOPR3 can be positive, but they may not have any symptoms, and it is cannot be diagnosed as vasculitis because it's a histopathologic yeah, diagnosis. Yeah, you have to have symptom. Um, but otherwise, oh, what yeah. to, otherwise, what are you going to treat? I mean, if the patient right. is completely asymptomatic, no organ involvement, no constitutional symptom, but you have some lab test positive, what, yeah. is, what are you going to treat? So, um, it, Robert, uh, that means the healthy patients can have positive anchor. Okay, what is uh, what else, Morshad? Uh, Walker, can you uh, take your slide off? Yeah. Okay, Professor Morshad, continue on. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's late night. Nice description. Okay. So, I, I, uh, we have a little bit of a um, question that <laughs> I can't answer. I'm glad that you came back. So, 
So, so the, the, the someone uh, posted uh, something probably from an article or textbook. It says, he, uh, this is Dr. Tabassum Samad, linear staining of immunoglobulin, IgG, on all glomerular capillary wall by immunofluorescence study is a characteristic feature of diabetic nephropathy and anti-GBM disease. Anti-GBM disease. Uh, and also, say she says she quoted from somewhere diabetic nephropathy. Have you heard no. of this? Diabetic nephropathy. There may be some, uh, some, some changes like that. That may be. That may. Be. But it is not linear, like okay. ribbon-like. Is, is this... it ribbon-like in case of diabetic nephropathy? I don't think so. I've never heard of this. So. I told her that I'm going to talk to the pathologist at Mayo Clinic and see, because I've never seen this reported uh, in any of my pathologies that we send all our pathology to it. And the Mayo Clinic has world-class nephropathologists. I'll ask them this question and get back because I couldn't answer this question. So um, I, I will go to Professor Ayvali Chaudhary for any concluding uh, comments. Bye, please. I wish I don't know on a glass. Hey, you see, is it in our country's past midnight? So, I think yeah. we, uh, the audience are also getting tired. Maybe, uh, we should uh, wrap up the session. And uh, once again, a uh, hearty congratulations to Planetaria Health Academia and their all the staff. They have arranged this uh, program and have refreshed our uh, knowledge. In fact, uncast vasculitis is the which is which causes RPGN is a medical emergency, and uh, uh, we should remain updated about these group of patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salam alaikum, everyone, for joining in and staying up to late, and especially the students and fellows and other participants. Also, I'm thankful to Nafisa for uh, this. Uh, keeping the tab on the, uh, the students who answer the questions and uh, have a wonderful uh, night. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wakar. Wakar. Yeah, that's all. I just want to say, immunofluorescence have you done two days? Yeah, two days, must. That's part of the day. I just want to say, what do you do? No, you should do it. No, I just want to say, what do you do? What do you do? I'm the Likhi the MPOP at three. I can do a letter of the Anka with IFA with reflex PR three MPO. That should be the order. I'm under the Canada to the positive. I have a little dumb, dumb double navel with horse double head to the store. The bus is in the store and the house. So, I'm C five blocker, Avaco point, Calcamita dumb the Kusilam, Arthur has a dollar, huh? Palman. I did this. C five A or C five block are only five hundred thousand dollar per year. Because uh -huh. this is an orphan drug, because it's a rare disease, they can uh, ask you for any money. Five hundred thousand dollar, if you lose a bump, a typical. Because it's developed. 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 Because it's developed